Hola. Natal. <laughs> I love it here. People said you're going to come to Natal. It's very hot. You're not going to like it. It's way too hot. But I said I love the heat. I love the beach. This is perfect for me. If I had to pick one place to live. <laughs> yes, I would live here. I think it's gorgeous. Uh, one of the nice things, we're right across from the beach, and I love the beach. How many of you know me? I know a lot of people here. So it's wonderful to see. Everyone is so kind. I travel all over the world, and I say one thing about the people in Brazil. You are the kindest people I ever met. You all have such big hearts. It's such a pleasure. <laughs> no, it, honestly, it is such a pleasure to be here. And I always appreciate it. People want to take pictures. They want to give hugs. I will always stop. I will always do that. I always appreciate you doing that. So I want to talk to you a little bit today. You know, we talk about the space program, the space shuttle, why we had a shuttle. We talk about the astronauts up on the space station, what they're doing in space. We talk about missions to Mars. I'm going to show you how some of the rovers got to Mars. And we talk about the future of the space program. And for me, for you, many of you are at a great age. As you're getting older and as you're getting looking for jobs, you're going to have many, many opportunities within the space program. So don't think you can't do something in the space program because you have so many opportunities. Right now you have NASA, you have SpaceX, you have many different companies doing things. So before we start, I just want you to think about three things. I'm going to talk a little bit about this later, but I want you to think about three things, okay? Do your best, enjoy what you do, believe in yourself. This will give you such a happy life, and your life should be fun. I want you all to think, you're not sitting here in this auditorium, we're all in Florida, we're all out on the beach, and we're always having fun. One of the best things about working at NASA, it's always fun. You never grow up. You're always a kid. You're always watching spaceships going up. You're by the beach. So I want you to pretend you're at the beach and having fun because that's the reality of living at NASA. So most of you know I've talked to some of you before about how much I hated school. I did terrible in school. And it was really funny because the last time I was here, I was talking to Donico, and he told me in one of the signs he had in the tent city said, be kind to your nerd. One day you will work for them. So I thought that was very, very funny. For me, I think you all are amazing. I did terrible in school. You're all so smart. You can do anything you want. So please continue to do what you're doing. You're doing great. So the first thing we talk about is something called STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And STEM is giving you an idea what you can do if you have a good job and a good background in math and science. Ever think you could help invent artificial intelligence? Or design the tools used to perform research on Mars? How about finding the cure for cancer? Or helping to develop a green fuel? Before you say no, think again. Think STEM. STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. Studying STEM opens you to a wide range of hands-on, cutting-edge careers and can create amazing opportunities. From designing rockets to building robots to writing the computer programs that will change the way we work and live, you can help shape the future of our world. Are you ready for the challenge? Then let's get started. So that's STEM. It gives you an idea what you can do if you like math and science. But we also have something called STEAM that has an A in it. Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Mathematics. And it's very, very important for me to include arts in everything we do. This is Tina. She's a very good friend of mine. She's a professional dancer. While I was studying engineering, she was studying dance at Juilliard School of Dance in New York City. And she became a professional dancer. And she taught me about STEAM. She said, hey, Gabe, when I'm studying arts, I have to learn these 10 things. I have to learn to be creative. I have to learn to build confidence, have a problem solving, develop challenges. All the same things you do in math and science, I do in arts. So a lot of way they're very interchangeable. And it's very important for me to include arts because you get a much different perspective and you get a much different product. 
It's one of my favorite pictures in the space program. I know a lot of you and some of you like astronomy, astrology, and love the stars. If you look up at the sky at night and it was completely black on Earth, you would see all those billions of stars above us every single night. It's the only light from the Earth that filters them out. But if it was completely black on Earth, you would see all those billions of stars every night. One of my favorite pictures when we had shuttle uh, launches, we had day launches and night launches. And the night launches were spectacular because it would be black outside. When the shuttle took off, it would literally turn night into day. It was that brilliant. At the beginning of the countdown, the moon was down here on the bottom. It was a big orange ball. It looked like the sun. As the countdown progressed, the moon rose and then the shuttle went right in front of it. It was a gorgeous picture. A very rare picture because there's two shuttles on the launch pad. Normally you had a space shuttle. The primary reason that we had a space shuttle was to build the International Space Station. It's the only thing large enough and powerful enough to take the big pieces up into space. So if the astronauts would go up in space, they were building a space station, they would go outside. If they had a problem, they could go inside the space station for safety. But we also have something in space called the Hubble telescope. It's a huge telescope. It's about the size of a school bus, and it's studying the universe. So this was a repair mission, and there was a concern if the astronauts were up in space trying to fix the shuttle and there was a safety issue, there was no place for them to go. So they were concerned they might die in space. So they had a second one on the launch pad as a rescue mission just in case it was necessary. It wasn't necessary, but it was the only time in the history of the space program that they had that picture. Same picture at night. You guys live by the beach. You have it so great. I love living by the beach. I go to the beach every chance I can. So when we're at the beach, you can drive in a boat behind the shuttles, or you can see them from the road. You can see them for about 16 kilometers away. They're brilliantly lit up at night. Uh, this is at the Vehicle Assembly Building. Uh, this is how I drive back and forth to work every day. It's great. I'm in a convertible catching the sun, and it's a lot of, sun, of fun. So inside the VAB, the Vehicle Assembly Building, that's where the shuttle is put together. That's why it's called assembled, inside the Vehicle Assembly Building. Once it's assembled, it has to go to the launch pad. So the launch pad is over here. It's about five kilometers away. It takes five hours to get there. So I don't know if you can see down here, this is a little person. It gives you an idea how big this is. This is called a crawler transporter. This is a mobile launch platform. And the shuttle actually has four main parts. The part that looks like a plane is called an orbiter. The part in the middle, the orange part, is a fuel tank. It has liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. And there's two solid rocket boosters. This is what it looks like at launch. There's three main engines in the orbiter and the two solid rocket boosters. Combined, that's three million kilos pushing against the Earth. Now, I want to tell you, show you a launch, but I want to tell you a little bit about it first. One of the cool things about the Space Center, we can get about five kilometers away. Most of the public gets about 50 kilometers away. But we can get five, so we're fairly close. So what happens at the launch? First thing you're going to see, inside that tank has liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. Those are two gases that are super cooled. They're put in this tank. They become very volatile, very explosive. And they sit out in the hot Florida sun, and they heat up. So anytime something heats up, it expands. So they have gases expanding all around the tank. They don't want to launch that way. The whole thing might go up in flames. So the first thing they have are igniters. They're at the bottom of the orbiter. You'll see their sparks. They're just burning off any vented fumes. The second thing you're going to see, what looks like smoke, but it's actually steam. They put 3 million liters of water on the launch pad for heat and noise suppression. So when this thing is taking off, we're about 5 kilometers away. We can see it, but it's very small, and we really can't hear it. So the first thing that happens when you see this launch, you're standing there, and your body just starts shaking. It starts at your feet. It goes through your whole body. You're just shaking. You can't see anything. You can't hear anything, but you can feel it. It's magical. It's the most wonderful sensation. People say, what's the best thing about being Kennedy? I say the launches. I go to every single launch I can. So your body is shaking like this, and all of a sudden, you see this thing take off, but it's really plays mind games with you because it's going further and further away, and it's getting louder and louder because it's going so fast, it's leaving the sound behind. So your body is shaking. You're watching this going on. Your mind is going crazy. So I want to show you a launch. I want you to imagine these things that I just explained to you. So these are the igniters. They're burning off any vented fumes. 
Now's when your body starts shaking. Starts at your feet and goes through your whole body. You're just shaking like this. It's amazing. And that's the steam from the water. So for the first two minutes, they're bouncing around quite a bit. This is called the flight deck, like the cockpit of an airplane. There's seven astronauts in that, in that orbiter. After two minutes, the big boosters fall off and it gets very smooth. When the boosters fall off, they fall off above the water. About a, a, two kilometers above the water, a parachute opens, they fall gently in the water, a ship goes out, picks them up, they're brought back, cleaned and reused. And the bolts, the boosters are hold on with these huge bolts that are about a meter long and 20 centimeters in diameter, and they literally blow them apart. Then the tank and the orbiter go up in orbit. The tank falls off and burns up in the atmosphere. So if you can imagine, you're sitting on a launch pad, eight and a half minutes later, you're in space. That's how fast it goes. From the, from the ground to space, eight and a half minutes. It's amazing. Who's this? Come on, who is it? You know who it is. Ah, Buzz Lightyear. Yeah, Buzz Lightyear that was brought into the space program for fun. Everything about it is fun. So they want to bring Buzz Lightyear in to get the kids interested. And Buzz Lightyear was named after a very famous astronaut, Buzz Aldrin, who was the second person to walk on the moon. And who's that? <laughs> what, yeah, what is that all the launches? Remember, everything about this is fun. You never want to grow up. You always want to be a kid. That's the magic of the space program. When you walk around Kennedy Space Center, any building, any hallway, everywhere you go, these magical pictures, it never stops. It's always exciting, it's always fun. So I'd like to know, can anybody guess, can anybody tell me what this is? Yeah, spaceship, somebody says, what's it doing? Sonic boom, excellent, yes. I said, breaking the sound barrier. Like I told you earlier, when this thing takes off, it goes so fast that you're watching it and it's disappearing from your sight, but the sound is getting louder and louder and it's getting further away. It really messes over your mind. To give you an idea how fast this thing goes, if you're on Earth and you have a rifle, a high-powered high rifle, and you fire the bullet, the bullet goes roughly 3,000 kilometers per hour. I love to race cars. I race cars for hubby. I would love to go 3,000 kilometers per hour. But when you're in the shuttle and you're going in space, you're going 27,000 kilometers per hour. So you're going nine times faster than a rifle bullet. If you can imagine how fast that is to break through the atmosphere to get up into space. This is called the orbiter processing facility and it's very, very important to me. I always like to talk to the girls. I'm not ignoring the guys, but I want all the girls, I want to talk to the girls for just a minute. Guys, listen, but this is directed to the girls. Because within the space program, girls do everything. They fly the orbiter, they navigate the orbiter, they maintain the orbiter. Within the shuttle program, women are a major part of the program. If you look back at the olden days when they sent missions to the moon, there's not one girl anywhere, not one. It's all guys. But with the advent of the shuttle program, there were many women engineers that came into the space program. So as a girl or as a guy, you can do anything you like in the space program. And it's especially important for me to let the girls know because it's very important to have both guys and girls in the space program. You get a much different perspective. You get a much different product. So it's very, very good. And I encourage any of the girls or guys, if you want to be in the space program, say, I want to be a space program. If you want to be an astronaut, say, I want to be an astronaut. You can do anything you want. And I'm going to tell you a little bit on how you can do it. It's not as difficult as you think. So this is called the orbiter processing facility. Remember the part that I told you looks like a plane? It's actually called an orbiter. So every time the orbiter goes up in space, it comes back down. It's completely disassembled. Everything is checked, and it's put back together. So you see this girl up on a forklift. Her job at the Space Center is to put the engine in the back of the orbiter after it's been reconditioned. And it's very critical. If she hits the engine on the side of the orbiter, she could damage the engine or damage the orbiter, create millions of dollars worth of damage, and delay the mission. So it's so important she does that right. It takes her three hours for one engine. She's excellent. I've seen her do it many times. She never makes a mistake. So again, I want the girls to know, and the guys, if you'd like to do something in the space program, you can do anything you want. 
Here she has, she's on a forklift, she has a handheld controller, moves the forks up and down, side to side, and that's how she guides it in. I love living by the beach, you guys live by the beach, it's so wonderful living by the beach. We have these gorgeous sunrises. They had a rocket launch yesterday, any guys see the rocket launch in here? So that was by the beach. The reason they're by the beach is they go over the water in case there's a problem, they fall down in the water, not on the land. This is the International Space Station. Again, the main reason we had a shuttle was the only thing large enough and powerful enough to take the big pieces up into space. It took 12 years to build a space station. That was five years into it. This is eight years into it. And this is how it looks now. It's completely finished. And the shuttle didn't stop flying because there was something wrong with it. The shuttle stopped flying because its mission, primary mission, was to build a space station. Once the space station was completed, it stopped. That's why it was not flying. This gives you an idea how big it is. That's an American football field, which is a lot bigger than a soccer field. So you can see it's much, much bigger than a soccer field. And every 90 minutes, it goes around the Earth one time. So the astronauts up in space, they're going 26,000 kilometers around the Earth. Every 90 minutes, they make one revolution. And when they're in space, they see the sun rise 16 times in one day. So there's 16 nations involved in building the International Space Station. And you see Brazil is one of them. And I always talk to the Brazilians because so many people want to go to NASA. So many people want to go to the space program outside of Brazil. But you have your own space program. I encourage you, especially all of you who have the brains and the knowledge, you can get involved in the space program and make your space program better. The more you get involved, the easier it's going to be to improve on it and get it to be, you don't have to go to NASA. You can stay right here and have your space program. Oops. Uh, can I back up one? Okay. One other thing I want to tell you, thank you. Uh, if you'd like to see the space station go over your house, it's not difficult. You can go outside and see it. You don't need a telescope. You don't need binoculars. All you have to do is Google, see the ISS, or go to the NASA, Gov NASA site and see, spot the station. But easiest way is just Google see the ISS. It will ask you for your home address and your email. And when it comes over your house, it will give you an alert. You can go outside and look at it. You don't need a telescope. You don't need binoculars. It's a bright, bright star. But normally when you see a star, you just see the light from that star. It's stationary. But with the, when this, uh, tele, uh, <laughs> the space station is going over, you actually see the star moving across the horizon. You can see it for four or five minutes. So remember, if you want something to do some night, just do that. Just find out when it's going over your house, and you can go see it. Next thing I'm going to show you is how it was put together. So each one of these pieces was brought up in the cargo bay of the orbiter. There's two big doors in the back. They open those big doors. They put this piece in. They go up in space. The astronauts put on a spacesuit. They go outside, and they have to assemble this. Now they're going 26,000 kilometers per hour, and they're floating. The part on the top are called solar arrays. They take energy from the sun. They convert it to electricity. That's what's used to power the space station. The part going diagonal across here is called the truss. I'm sure a lot of you are engineering students and study engineering. If you study engineering, you know a truss is something that simply gives a structure strength. There's a truss above the ceiling so it doesn't fall down. All structures have trusses. The cylindrical parts coming this way, those are where the astronauts live and work. And they go up in space, they stay up there for six months. And while they're up there, they're floating in microgravity. And they're learning to do things in space that we can't do on Earth. It's a very sterile environment. So they do a lot of scientific stuff in space that we can't do on Earth. You can see when the solar rays are brought up, they're brought up in thin cylinders, and then they're expanded once they're in space. The bottom says which country built the module and which one was taken up. This up here is called the Canadian arm. It's used to move pieces around the space station. I'll tell you a little bit about that later. Japan, Japanese Space Agency, Japan is very big within the space program, European countries. Node 3 cupola, it's a very interesting module. It goes on the bottom, and in the bottom of it, it's glass enclosed. So when the astronauts go up in space, if they want to look down on the Earth or look at the solar system, they go to the cupola module, and they look out. And I have a pretty cool movie to show you what it's like to be up in space and look down on the Earth. 
So that's what it looks like when it's all completed. I like to show you this because it's a three-dimensional view and you get an idea how big it is. Remember, it's much, much bigger than a soccer field. It's going 26,000 kilometers around the Earth and every 90 minutes it goes around once. So it's very important to understand. I always like to talk about learning. Learning is so important. For most of us, we're always learning our whole life. We never stop learning. And the best way to learn is to make it fun. The more fun you have learning, the easier it will be, and the longer you'll remember it. So for the astronauts, they have to go up in space and have to build a space station. Well, they've never done that. They don't know how to do it, so they have to learn. But they have to learn how to do it when they're floating. Well, we can't float on Earth because gravity holds us down. So they have to figure out how we're going to float on Earth to practice what we're going to do in space. So our body is what's called buoyant. Buoyant means you float in water. So the NASA said, okay, let's train in water floating like we do in space. But we don't want to float on the top. We want to float in the middle because it's more realistic. So when you float in the middle, that's called neutral buoyancy. Neutral buoyancy means you don't float, you don't sink. So if we jump in the water, we float on top because we're buoyant. They put a weight belt proportional around your waist, so you come down this pool. There's a big pool in Houston, Texas. It's called a neutral buoyancy laboratory. It's about 14 meters deep by 50 meters wide by 70 feet long, and that's where the astronauts train in a neutral buoyancy state, right in the middle. This astronaut, you can see, is getting ready to go in the water. Everything is identical to in space. The spacesuit, everything is the same as they're going to do in space. This is part of the truss. If you put that in the water, it would fall to the bottom. So they have to prop it up in a neutral buoyancy state. This astronaut, now she's getting ready to go in the water. Anywhere she goes, two divers accompany her. In the case there's a problem, they can get her right out of the water. Here's something that looks so simple on Earth. I have a shop, I build cars, I race cars. If I want to put a screw in a wall in my shop, I use my body strength and torque. It's real simple. But if you're up in space, you're floating. So if we were all in a space station right now, we'd be somewhere between the ceiling and the floor. We'd be right in the middle. We wouldn't go up and we wouldn't go down. But in that position, you have no strength, you have no torque. So something as simple as putting a screw on a, on a wall on Earth becomes very complicated in space. One of the things I love to talk about, I love sports. I had a terrible time in school because I always wanted to be playing sports or at the beach. And for me, it was like they took me off the beach and they stuck me in this box and they said, read. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be outside of the beach or I wanted to be playing sports. I had a really, really hard time in school. But it's very, very important. I love sports because you play as a team. You never win as an individual in a team sport. So sports teaches you a lot. The main thing it does, it teaches you how to get along. And most adults don't know how to get along. Well, kids are always saying, my parents are complaining about this, my parents are complaining about that. And they do that, and the kids learn it, and they grow up complaining. So try to get along. One of the things I like to ask now is, anybody know what a triathlon is? Can anybody tell me what a triathlon is? The sporting events, anybody know what you do? Yes? See, bike swimming and running, very good. Swim, biking, and running. So I do triathlons, but I do them in a very, very special way. This is my BFF. You all have a BFF. This is my BFF. His name is Randall. He's totally blind. He can't see anything. And I want you all to think from this day forward for the rest of your life, uh, my BFF is now your BFF. Your new BFF, his name is Randall. He's going to go with you anywhere you go. And any time you can't do something, he's going to say, look, I'm blind. I can do anything. So can you. We all go through stages in our lives where we hit walls. We don't think we can do something. But if you have your BFF beside you, he's saying, look, I'm blind. I can do it. You can too. Don't ever think you can't do something. It's so important. And if you think you can, I promise you, Randall will be right beside you and will say, look, I'm blind. I can do it. So can you. So think about that. You're always going to have this guy beside you. And you have Gabe with you too. If you let me come with you, I'll be cheering for you too. I want you all. My biggest message to you, it's not about space. It's about enjoying life. Life should be fun. One of the reasons I do this is because I see so many people complaining, so many people unhappy, and so many kids learn that from their parents. It doesn't have to be that way. I never worked one day in my life. I've always had fun. I've never had stress. I've never had pressure. I'm no different than you guys. I just look at it a little differently. And I'm going to tell you how you can do that. It's not that hard. So Randall came to me one day and he said, hey, Gabe, I want to do a triathlon. I said, okay, what's a triathlon? He said, we got to swim, bike, and run. 
And I said, okay, let's go do it. He said, I can't. I said, why not? He said, I'm blind. But you do everything else. Let's go figure it out. So the first thing we do is a swim. We swim about 750 meters. We put a rope around my waist, a rope around his waist, with a five-meter meter bungee between us. And I have to guide him through the swim. I can't pull him or I'll be exhausted. And I always kid around. I can't let him get ahead of me because we don't know where we're going. So it's really important. I guide him through the swim and I stay ahead of him. The second thing we do is we ride a bike, a tandem bike. We go about 50 kilometers and we have to pedal together. If we don't pedal together, we'll be exhausted for the last part, which is a 5K run. When we do the 5K run, we have about a 30 centimeter rope. I hold one end, he holds the end. That's how we do the triathlon. So I want you to think about something just for a few seconds. I want you to think you're totally blind. You can't see. And you're going to run five kilometers as fast as you can. And you're holding on to a little rope. And we're very competitive. You're going to run for about 25 minutes as fast as you can. And you can't see. And I'm going to be saying to you, turn left, turn right. We're going up a hill. We're on gravel. We're on dirt. And all you're doing is running and holding on to this little rope. Now, I tried it one time. I got a blindfold. I got my own sided guide, and I ran a 5K blindfolded. It's very, very scary, I can tell you. He has tremendous courage. So remember, he's going to be with you the rest of your life. Anytime you think you can't do something, he's going to say, yes, you can. You can do anything you want. Don't ever think you can't do anything. So this astronaut, she's a neutral buoyancy. She's not going up. She's not going down. That Canadian arm that I told you about earlier, it's over here, and she's just practicing on that. And she does that for a whole year. This is something that practice electrical connections. So the next thing I'm going to show you what it's like to live on the space station. But I want to tell you a little bit about it first. When you're up on the space station, you use no muscles whatsoever. You never lift anything up. Everything is floating. You never use your muscles. So if you're up there for six months and you don't use any muscles, when you come back down to Earth, you're just going to flop down. So every day they have to exercise. So they have a, a stationary bike and they have a treadmill. Now the treadmill is funny, it's not on the floor like this, it's actually on a wall like that. And they're floating, and they're running on a treadmill floating. And the third thing they have is a hydraulic or vacuum type of weights. There's no weights, but you lift weights every day. So they exercise for three hours every day. This guy's riding a stationary bike. You see his water bottle is floating beside him. I'm always looking for my water bottle. His is right there. This guy's got his feet hooked so he doesn't float away. But everything is floating. Even the crew. And this guy's shaving. He doesn't have to put his razor down. It's just floating around. And the guy in the back is actually taking a bath. You can't take a shower bath, water goes everywhere. So they take a cloth and they wipe themselves down. This guy's taking a drink. Anytime you put a liquid in space, it goes into a ball. So he made it too big, so he cuts it in half. And everybody sleeps in a sleeping bag. Now you can sleep standing on your head, horizontal, vertical, any position you want, it feels the same. So if you want to sleep standing on your head, you can do that. They sleep in a sleeping station with their Velcroed in so they don't float around and bump into something. To get around, you give yourself a little push and you never stop. This great big box on Earth, if this box was in this room, all of us put together, all of us couldn't move it. We couldn't even budget. But in space, it weighs nothing. So she's moving around all by herself. And for the girls or guys with long hair, you've got to pin it up, or it will just be a big powder puff, completely engross your face. So they all have to pin it up. And they're sitting around a the table. There's no chairs. They're all floating. They're having a little taco break. Now, the two guys in the back are just floating a little bit higher.
So that's E.T. Everybody says, where does E.T. come from? Now you know. E.T. comes from the space station. He hangs out up there. Every once in a while, he comes down, says hello, and goes back up. So we'd like to ask you, all of you, how many of you think we'd like to go up in space and stay up in space? I raise my hand. I would love to go. Tonico wants to go. I hope you will all think about it. You will have this opportunity in your lifetime to go to space. And think about it. If you go up, you'll be floating around. It's a lot of fun to try to do that. The next thing I'm going to show you what it's like to be up on the space station and look down on the Earth. This is through the Kupla module. So you see, you see how all of the continents are lit up. And one of the things the astronaut talks about, how these electrical storms, how these huge storms are hundreds of kilometers long, and there's lightning all over the Earth. The greenish layer on the top is called the ionosphere. It separates our atmosphere from outer space. Those are the solar rays. They're always pointed towards the sun. Now remember, every 90 minutes, there's a new day in space. So when the astronaut's up in space, 16 times a day they see the sunrise. So this is kind of my favorite part coming up. So these are the northern lights, how they look from space. I've always wanted to see the northern lights, one of my things I want to try to do. But the northern lights happen when solar storms come from the sun. They come with electrons, an electrical charge that bounces off our atmosphere of oxygen and nitrogen and creates a spark. And they can be green or yellow or orange or blue or purple, depending on the altitude and depending on whether it's oxygen or nitrogen. One of the more fun things for me working at Kennedy Space Center or being at Kennedy Space Center, the astronauts, they live and they train in Houston, Texas. So most of their time is spent in Houston, Texas. But anytime there's a launch, they have to come to Kennedy in Florida. That's where they launch from. So they'll come about two weeks ahead of time and hang out. We get to talk to them and spend some time. Then they go up in space for six months. They come back down. We get to talk to them again. And one of the questions they always get asked and people always say, what are the astronauts doing in space for fun? What is the most fun thing to do? And I don't care how many astronauts you talk to, how many times they've been in space, every single one says the same thing. They love looking out the window. They think that's the most fun thing because they see this, they see the stars, and they see the solar system. When a solar storm comes from the sun, it comes with electrons. There's also something called a solar flare. It comes with ions, protons, and electrons. And when they hit the Earth's atmosphere, they give all these electrical charges, and they mix with oxygen and nitrogen. And they turn the sky, instead of being black, it turns into all of these colors at the same time. And scientists always track electrical flares because they mess up Earth's navigation and Earth's communication system. So they always announce there's going to be a solar flare. So if there's any, anywhere near and you hear about a solar flare, try to go outside because this is the magic of what you'll see. The future of the space program involves going to Mars. Mars is really, oops, oops. Can we back up one? Thank you. The future of the space program involves going to Mars. They say, well, why do we want to go to Mars? What's the fascination with Mars? Well, if you look at Mars and you look at Earth, they're very similar. And scientists believe billions of years ago that Mars was just like Earth, that it had oceans and lakes and rivers, and it even had an environment like Earth. So they really believe at one time something may have lived on Mars. It may still be alive now. And that's what the fascination is with going, with, with going to Mars. So if you look at Mars and you look at Earth, Mars is about one-half the size of Earth. 
and Mars is spinning, our, our planet is spinning, Earth is spinning at 1,600 kilometers per hour. Right now, as we're on the planet, it's going 1,600 kilometers per hour. There's 24 hours in Earth Day. Mars is spinning at 800 kilometers per hour. There's 24 hours and 37 minutes in a Mars day. So there's a lot of similarities between the two. And they're both tilted at the same axis. So they say, okay, let's jump on a ship and go to Mars. Well, it's not quite that simple. First of all, Mars is roughly 400 million kilometers from Earth. And Earth is spinning and Mars is spinning. And they're both going around the sun. They're going at different speeds in different orbits. Now remember, the Earth is spinning at 1,600 kilometers per hour. It's going around the sun at 110,000 kilometers per hour. So if you can imagine, our planet, as we're sitting on it right now, is going 110,000 kilometers per around the sun, and it's spinning at 1,600 kilometers per hour. And it takes 365 days to go around the sun once. Mars is spinning at 800 kilometers per hour, and it's going about 87,000 kilometers around the sun, and it takes 687 days for Mars to go around the sun. So you have the Earth spinning, Mars spinning, both of them going around the sun, different speeds, different orbits, 400 million kilometers away. You want to launch something from Mars and have it land exactly where you want, uh, from Earth and have it land exactly where it want on Mars. So there were three kinds of rovers that went to Mars. I'm going to show you how one of these rovers got to Mars. But there's actually three kinds. The smallest one in the middle is called Sojourner. It was the first rover to go to Mars. And it's maybe 60 centimeters by 60 centimeters by 60 centimeters. It's pretty small. But they sent it to Mars to test the landing system. It was an inflatable ball. And they wanted to see if they could land and survive. That's what Sojourner went to. The next one is, there was two of them. One was called Spirit. One was called Opportunity, and they were sent to Mars to look for water because scientists believe anytime water exists, that life exists in one form or another. And the third one is called Curiosity. Now, Curiosity is huge. Curiosity is about 2,000 kilos. It's about the size of a car, and it's nuclear-powered. The other two are solar-powered. So this is Sojourner. Sojourner was sent to Mars, again, to test the landing system. The landing system consisted of a big bag and had to land in that bag and it had to navigate off of that platform. And then it went around looking for water on Mars and just studying Mars. It was only up there a short time. This is called Spirit. Now there were two rovers. One was called Spirit and one was called Opportunity. And they were sent to Mars to look for water. Because again, scientists believe if water exists, life exists. Now I want to show you how these rovers got to Mars. But I want to tell you something about what it's like to be on Kennedy Space Center. Yesterday, how many of you saw the launch here yesterday? We were all in a little room watching the launch. A few of you saw it. Now, if you noticed, when they counted down with the launch, everybody counts down with it. So I'm working as an engineer in an engineering office. So you're sitting in this engineering office and they announce over a public system, there's going to be a launch in 10 minutes. So we all run outside and we got to watch this launch. So I want you to think, you're all not here in this room. We're all going to run outside and we're going to watch this launch. And you're going to hear all of the launch engineers giving countdowns and giving OK. Then the launch countdown will direct. It'll be 10, 9, 8. And when they do that, I want you to count down with it. Countdown with 10, 9, 8. And when it launches, we all jump up and down. We jump up and down because it's so much fun. So this is a Delta rocket. This Delta rocket has nine boosters. Comes from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. So that's Mars, 400 million kilometers from Earth. And the rover weighs about 200 kilos, and it's inside this nose cone. SSC, disconnect, enable on. Very high. Let guys go. Hydraulics go. You see pressurized vehicle locks tank. Pressurizing. SSC, hydraulic pump control on. On. CLCDR, pad B, deck flush on. On. Go. Okay, so count down with it. Eight, come on. Seven, six, six, five, four, four. Come on, we're going to see a launch jump up and down. Four, Get excited. Three, we're waiting in the two, office. One. And what do you say when it goes off? Say blast off. We all jump up and down the clap. Come on. Let's do it. <laughs> all right. <hey. laughs> you want to have fun. You want to enjoy this. It's magic. Sometimes we're waiting for 60 days and we're counting down every day. And when it goes, it's so exciting. 
I want you to feel that, share it, because it's magic. So you're going to see these nine boosters. When it gets to a certain speed and certain altitude, the boosters will start falling off. So you're going to see there's a lot of different pieces on this mission. Some are for navigation, to keep it going in the right direction, and some are for propulsion, to keep it going at the right speed. Remember, it has to overcome all of those variables. Each time one of those pieces is used, it's just left in space. So you're going to see when it goes by the sun, you're going to see the sun and all the billions of stars in our solar system. So I always like to ask you, can anybody tell me, can anybody guess how long does it take to get to Mars? Seven months. How'd you know that? Oh, was that <laughs> Okay. So <laughs> anytime something goes through an atmosphere, it generates a lot of heat. So it has to have a heat shield to protect it. If it didn't have that heat shield, it would just burn up now, the mission would be a failure. So it's going about 3,000 kilometers per hour when it's going through the atmosphere. Mars' atmosphere is very thin, so it doesn't slow down. So the first thing happens, the big parachute opens to slow it down. Then the heat shield will fall away. After the heat shield falls away, it's in this inflatable canister. When that rope gets 100 meters long, it will inflate. And it's still going very fast, so they slow it down with some more rockets. And about 500 meters above the surface, they just let it go. And it bounces and rolls and bounces and rolls. Remember, it went 400 million kilometers. It took seven months to get there. It's very fragile, and that's how it landed. And everything had to work perfectly. First thing, it had to be on its wheels, so when it deflates, it will be able to navigate around. First thing that happens, solar panels unfold. They take energy from the sun. They convert it to electricity. That's what's used to power the rover. Then a TV camera comes up, and it takes pictures. So this is computer generated. It's going to show it cruising around Mars. But it really will go about seven meters. It will stop. It will send a signal back to Earth. A scientist or a geologist will analyze it and tell it what to do for the next seven meters. And it's really fun. I, I met there's three women, just like you have a joystick at home for your computer games. They drive this around Mars, and they're great to talk to because when you talk to them, they talk about driving around Mars like we talk about going next door in our car. They're really a lot of fun. They think this was a lake bed at one time. They think this area was filled with water. If you're over here in, in Natal or anywhere you are where there's a body of water, if it dries up, you will see a lot of rocks on the bottom. That's why they think it was a big lake at one time. So they were sent to Mars to look for water. So well, how does this thing look for water? So what it does, it has a drill in the front of it, and will find a rock. It will drill a hole in the rock and look at the center of what's called the core. And inside the center, you will see these different lines. A geologist can say how old that rock is by the number of lines and the distance between them. And they can tell if water was present by the color. So in some ways, it looks like Earth. You see the mountains and you see all of the sand. There's many places on Earth that kind of look like this. So there's somebody driving this around, they're going seven meters and they stop and they're looking around. And they will see a big rock, instead of hitting that rock and tipping itself over, it drives around that rock. And then it's going to take a core sample. It's going to look at the center of a rock to see if water was present when it was formed. So it has this drill, this drill will drill a hole in it, look at the center, and the reason they look at the center instead of the outside, because age and weather can change the outside. But the center of the core will be just the way it when it was formed. So 
So you're going to see these different lines. Each one of those lines represents a segment in time. And based on the distance between them, a geologist can say how old that rock is. And based on the color, if water was present when it was formed. So this rover, this rover is called Spirit. There were two. One was called Spirit. One was called Opportunities. They were sent to Mars in 2004 to look for water. And they were only supposed to last 90 days. That was their life expectancy. Now, one of them went for five years. Now, I don't know if you guys, can you guys drive your car on the beach here? Can you get in your car and drive on the beach? Well, we can in Florida. We can drive our car on the beach. If we're in the packed sand, it's no problem. But if we get out of the packed sand and get in the loose sand, we're going to get stuck. There's no way we can get out. So one of these rovers, after five years, it was cruising around Mars. It got in some deep sand, and they couldn't get it unstuck. So it couldn't charge the batteries, so it died. But the other one is still going. It's called Opportunity. And I want to show you a little movie about what Opportunity is doing on Mars for the last 14 years. The first extraterrestrial marathon presented by science at NASA. With all the fanfare about Mars rover Curiosity landing on the red planet in August 2012, it's easy to forget that there's already a rover on Mars, an older, smaller cousin set to accomplish a feat unprecedented in the history of solar system exploration. Mars rover Opportunity is on track to complete the first extraterrestrial marathon. A marathon is 26.2 miles. When Opportunity landed on Mars in 2004, NASA's goal was to have the rover travel a meager 600 meters. However, no one knew what kind of runner Opportunity would turn out to be. As of July 2012, Opportunity has traveled almost 22 miles, only 4.2 short of a full marathon. Runner author Hal Higdon once said, The marathon never ceases to be a race of joy, a race of wonder. That goes double for a marathon on another world where every mile promises a new discovery. Opportunity's prime mission is to search for signs of ancient water. Today, the red planet is a bone-dry desert with breathtakingly thin atmosphere, conditions deadly to almost every known form of life on Earth. Billions of years ago, however, things might have been different. Many researchers believe that Mars was warmer, wetter, and friendlier to Martian life. Opportunity's job is to search for clues to that ancient time. Just getting to the starting line was epic. This particular marathoner had to fly about 283 million miles across space before being unceremoniously drop-bounced on the Martian surface, says Ray Arvidson, Mars Exploration Rover Mission Deputy Principal Investigator. Like many long-distance runners, Opportunity likes to take it slow. On a typical drive day, the rover travels only 50 to 100 meters. This gives the rover time to pause and look for the unknown and take some photos along the way. Recently, Opportunity sent home its 100,000th image, a stunning panorama of the Mars scape. Opportunity first uncovered signs of water in deposits near the landing site in Eagle Crater. There were rocks that seemed to have formed in an ancient shallow lake. Over the next four years, Opportunity scavenged ever larger and deeper craters, finding more evidence of wet periods. Indications were, however, that the ancient lake water might have been too acidic for life. The metallic marathoner soon set its sights on Endeavor Crater, an enormous pit 14 miles wide and hundreds of meters deep. Endeavor's depth would offer a look farther back into the history of Mars, to a time when the water was possibly less acidic. The marathon route crossing Mars Meridiani Plain to Endeavor was a daring trek, with no aid stations anywhere. Raging dust storms reduced the rover's solar power so much that Opportunity almost entered the sleep of death. Soft, sandy, wind-blown ripples trapped the rover's wheels. And there was an injury. A failure in Opportunity's right front steering actuator made running forward tricky. Ever resourceful, the rover ran part of its race backwards. The course took opportunity over sedimentary bedrock made of magnesium, iron, and calcium sulfate minerals, further indication of water billions of years ago, says Arvidson. When the marathoner reached Endeavor Crater in August 2011, things got interesting. Endeavor is surrounded by fractured sedimentary rock, and the cracks are filled with gypsum. Gypsum forms when groundwater comes up and fills cracks in the ground, depositing hydrated calcium sulfate. 
This is the best evidence we've ever found for liquid water on Mars. The gypsum veins were likely formed in conditions more pH neutral and possibly more hospitable to life. Jackpot. But this marathoner isn't done. Opportunity is doing so well that 26.2 miles might not be the finish line after all. We have no plans to stop running, says Arvidsson. Extraterrestrial ultra marathon, anyone? For more news about other NASA missions going the extra mile, visit science.nasa.gov. Do any of you run marathons? Anybody run a marathon in here? I don't. <laughs> but I know a lot of people in America do, and I see a lot of people running along the beach here. So this thing is actually still going. This movie's a little bit old, and it's got 45 kilometers now. What they talked about in the movie, I don't know if you noticed,